All right, welcome back for our second panel discussion of the afternoon. A couple of friendly reminders. Um, if you'd like to submit a question to the panelists during today's session, please use the Q&A function, and please remember to submit the question to all panelists. Uh, second, if you want to use the closed, ca closed captioning feature, please click on the three dots on the bottom of your screen in order to avail yourself of that flexibility. This next topic is something that has been in the news quite a bit lately and has affected many companies, many communities, and, and, and banks uh, are, are no less exposed than, than the, the rest of the um, companies out there. Ransomware and other major cyber events are on the rise. One of the most helpful methods that we've found is for a bank to assess its contingency plan by playing out a scenario to identify potential gaps and how they would respond. The next panel will walk through a series of steps that you as a CEO and your team will need to consider for rapid decision making upon the discovery or receipt of notice of a cyber intrusion. Moderating today's panel is Anna Babiez, President and Senior, excuse me, Chief Executive Officer of Fidelity Federal Savings and Loan Association, a Federal Mutual Savings Association in Delaware, Ohio. I will turn it over to Anna to introduce herself and the panel. Thank you, Mike. As Mike has said, my name is Anna Babiez. I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer from Fidelity Federal Savings and Loan Association in Delaware, Ohio. Joining me today are panelists are Kevin Allard, Superintendent of the Division of Financial Institutions, Ohio Department of Commerce. Kevin Greenfield, Deputy Comptroller for Operational Risk, Office of the Comptroller of Currency. And Martin Henning, Deputy Director for Operational Risk, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Welcome, and thanks for all, all of you to help us think through these severe operational events. As they said in the last session, technology is here to stay. Unfortunately, the news doesn't seem to be getting any better regarding the reality of operational events. Before we get into some ransomware scenario, I thought we could talk more broadly to introduce the topic. Starting with Kevin Greenfield, what are the most severe operational incidents you see occurring today? So, well, we've observed a range of issues that are ransomware events, everything ranging from uh, DDoS, distributed denial of service attacks for Bitcoin, where they try to interrupt your uh, service, to very severe instant instances where actual core systems and data are, are, are encrypted and locked up and everything in between. And key things that I want to share is th this, this is real, it does happen. You read many of the events in the newspapers, there are many more that you never hear about, and it is occurring. It's occurring, unfortunately, because it's successful. The bad guys are getting paid. Two things that I just to share with you that I've observed, uh, again, the most severe incident being that of encrypting all of the core systems and data is over the past 18 to 24 months, we have seen exponentially more ransomware events impacting the financial sector than we've observed in the prior five years. So, so it is increasing and it's be vigilant on. And secondly, um, speaking from experience, you do not want to be that institution that um, has had their core systems and all of their data encrypted. That, that's a very difficult position to be in and you wanna do everything you can to prevent it. Thank you. So, Kevin Allard, I, I guess you've seen some of these events too. What is the range of outcomes you've seen for the companies? But certainly, have read about attacks in the press, and uh, certainly talking with peer regulators, have heard about uh, banks that have been attacked. And as Kevin Greenfield just said, ransomware attacks are real. What we have seen in Ohio is uh, corporate account takeover or so-called Cato events. Uh, outcomes with either of these cyber events is not good. It leads to a significant disruption in operations. You're invoking your incident response plan. Maybe a bank pays a ransom. Maybe a bank is able to get its data or its backup data back. In a Cato event, typically the money is, is out of the bank and an overseas bank very quickly and is likely untouchable ever again. So, in as much as your customers or the public may be aware of your event, you certainly have uh, reputational issues that you're going to have to work through. So, I, I guess the, the short story is outcomes in these situations are typically not good. Thank you. 
Uh, and Martin Henning, uh, what are some of the controls you've seen deployed that are effective in mitigating incident impact? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Anna. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, coordinating this panel and and uh, bringing us all together too. I, I um, thinking back about the best answer to this question. I, I think it's things you all have probably heard. We use the phrase uh, good cyber hygiene often. And I, we've got some uh, materials at, at the end for you all, but just looking through those, the, the things to, to mitigate uh, the risk here are things you've, you've heard about before. So a few highlights, um, uh, uh, good backups, good backups and recovery plans to restore those backups. Um, in the case of ransomware, uh, we add the adjective immutable in front of the backup. So uh, storage of backup data and source code in such a way that whatever is impacting the production systems and data and encrypting those is less likely to get to those backups so that they're good when when the time comes to use them. Um, you know, more preventative uh, controls that are effective, strong risk-based authentication controls. Not, nothing new there either. Um, that that really comes to mind first in terms of of mitigating the risk at the front end. Once uh, in in there, you know, we're we're thinking of course about things like uh, multi-factor authentication and uh, the use of that as the risk of the particular user uh, increases. Uh, the more likely that multi-factor authentication is appropriate. And then, you know, a, a third uh, basic control, cyber hygiene type control, uh, good limited authorization or um, uh, least privilege, we say, in, in cybersecurity. So once the person or the system has authenticated uh, to your uh, network or your data center, uh, allowing them only the access to the resources that they need to do their job. And that's a trade-off for convenience, always, always has been, uh, but the tighter those controls are, um, the, the, least, the, the lower the risk that uh, a malicious actor trying to uh, attack using ransom malware is going to be, be effective. So those are, you know, again, basic cyber hygiene things. Uh, there are things that you all probably heard before. But when we see those controls in place effectively, the risk, even when there is an attack, it's, it's able to be contained. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. It's not hard to see why we're talking about this topic today. Let's transition into walking through a ransomware scenario. As we walk through the scenario, I'm going to ask some broad questions that we'd like the audience to answer through the polling function. This isn't a test. No one is going to be graded and your answers are anonymous. But we want, we want to engage your thinking about the key decision points you would face as a leader and perhaps spur some thinking in your areas you hadn't considered. So I would like to next set up the scenario. Uh, your bank CEO who has just received frantic communication regarding systems going offline. It appears files on servers are being encrypted. A ransomware demand note has been discovered. All right, that sets the stage. And if the WebEx facilitator could open up the first poll question, which is what would be the first instruction you would give or decision point you would face if this was your institution? You have about a minute to anonymously select one of these answers. And then Kevin Greenfield, will you help talk us through these observations at this point in the attack? Okay, we'll give everyone that minute and uh, see what the responses are. But in, in the interim, while we're waiting for responses, the one thing that I do want to share with the audience here is um, we work very closely with our interagency partners. So Kevin Allard and Martin Henning, we've uh, worked very closely with, with the FFIC. And the thing I want to assure you is Anytime the three of us are on a call together with our bosses, they tend to be very scared because this is all we talk about. Just being fun, uh, funny here, but it is it is a serious, serious issue. Okay, going through and looking through 
the issue. It seems mo most of the respondents looked at uh, enter D and instruct the IT team to do whatever is necessary. And this is something that uh, with this answer, th there is no one right answer. But the one thing I would communicate to everyone in the audience is the importance of how many of these items can be predetermined and pre-identified as part of an incident response program and that you know the answers, you know who are the key people who need to be involved, where are the outside expertise and resources you need, who do you need to communicate, as much of that as you can identify beforehand and plan out through exercises, the better prepared you'll be because when these attacks occur, I assure you they are not going to occur at 930 in the morning on a Monday. They're going to occur 10 p.m. on a Friday evening <laughs> or over the weekend sometime or when people are most least likely. But the answer D, clearly stopping the impact is, is very important. And what's also important is when you do so, do not make it worse or create additional harm. And what do I mean by that is stop the attack get your experts, both internal IT as well as external for forensics experts involved in making key decisions around, do you cease operations? Do you disconnect from the internet? I know one thing that's always asked, do I shut down my computer? Well, guess what? If the malware is something that's activated when it's set to reboot, you've just activated it. So getting that expertise on site and involved quickly to identify what the issue is and what is the best response to, as uh, I have many friends who um, work in EMS services, stop the bleeding. Don't make sure that you're able to um, take those and, and again, and to take those actions. And again, relying on the resources. If you haven't already engaged with or have a relationship with a, a, a forensics firm, I would encourage you to do so, or if you have cyber insurance, we have observed where the um, insurance companies will provide those resources because they also want to mitigate the damage and mitigate the um, losses. So very much making sure that you have those lined up beforehand so that when you need them, they can get quickly involved. Communication with key stakeholders and making decisions whether to stop operations or not. Um, these are tough decisions, but depending on the severity of the issue of the incident, you may need to make a decision to cut off online banking, shut down the system and only process transactions manually through branches. Uh, again, as much as you can plan ahead of time for those scenarios and prepare for them, the better off you'll be and be in a position to make those decisions but it's going to be a uh, very important that you do so um, as well as notification who do you notify law enforcement getting them involved your primary regulatory agency um, we have been contacted when there have been these ransomware events and the one thing that the regulatory agencies can do is we have experience and can share that with you. Clearly, we're going to want to assess the safety and soundness issues, but we're also how do can we help align resources such as those I'll speak for 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 myself from the federal side of the government. But how how can we help facilitate that through U.S. Treasury? So there's a lot of benefits there. But having that ability to triage the situation, quickly stop the damage, and we have seen companies shut down from the internet. And when I say shut down, I'd be careful. I do not mean turn off your computer. <laughs> I, I mean, disconnect from the internet or stop operations in order to mitigate the damage. Um, and those are decisions you're gonna need to make. You're gonna need to make quickly. And those decisions may be coming on a Friday night or in the in the very early hours of, of the um, weekend. So those are things to be uh, prepared for. Thank you, Kevin. And even a small bank like myself, I think we should still be worried about something like this. Absolutely. Um, 
I have seen community banks actually tend to be targeted um, uh, for some of these attacks. I have seen it in um, large institutions, clearly um, subject to access service providers. The malicious actors, they're criminals, plain and simple, and they're looking for the highest return based on the least effort. And going back to Martin had mentioned some of the controls what they tend to look to exploit are simple things that the source of these attacks tend not to be very sophisticated. A phishing email with combined with stealing someone's credential and weak authentication can gain access to the system. Not configuring widely used software. Um, when many companies are operating on Microsoft or other commonly used software products, the malicious actors have the same access to those configuration manuals online as your staff and as your IT companies and service providers. Knowing how to configure them and again, not getting overly complex, simple things as changing the default administrator passwords, you'd be surprised, but the bad guys are out there looking for these easy points of access. There are definitely sophisticated attacks, but many of them stop uh, start with very simple control failures. Thank you, Kevin. Now we're going to move to the middle of the event. The WebEx facilitator could put up the second poll question, which is, what is the biggest milestone after the initial day's activities and before recovery? Again, you have one minute to answer, and then Kevin Allard will rely, will relay some of his experience from regulator standpoint. So our options are determining recovery feasibility using backups, agreeing with third party vendors how to reconnect, completing key communications outside the institution, deciding whether or not to pay the ransom. All right, we have about 30 seconds left. All right, if we could see our results, that would be great. I think like Kevin Greenfield said, I, I don't think there's a wrong answer here. There's several things that would be considered milestones, and I'm going to try to touch on almost all of these. Uh, one of the first things you need to decide is, are we inclined to pay the ransom? Some considerations to think about uh, goes to the actually the most popular answer here is we need to make a, a conclusion about data recovery feasibility, meaning the less feasible it is that we're going to recover our data, we may be more inclined to uh, to have to pay a ransom. Did any of our sensitive data get extracted such that we no longer control where it's at? What is the advice from law enforcement in terms of uh, how to respond and whether to pay a ransom or not? And then we also need to consult the OFAC regulations with regard to sanctions in terms of who we can and can't pay money to as financial institutions. So those are a couple of considerations in terms of uh, uh, deciding whether to pay a, a ransom. One of the key questions you're going to face here, and it's referenced here, is uh, how do we decide if and when we're ready to reconnect our primary services to the internet? So, what are some considerations around that? Obviously, you're working closely with your your third party vendor and making that determination. How confident are we that malware has been removed? How effective has our business continuity strategy been? How many services have we been able to keep uh, running in some sort of fashion in the in during this event? And what controls do we need to have in place to prevent this from happening again into the foreseeable future? So we're now a week or so into the event. 
What are we likely to know? What may be actionable in terms of information we may have, may have gathered? Hopefully we're pretty far along in terms of getting our forensic results. Uh, we hopefully should know the attack vector. So where did the attack come from and how did it happen? What vulnerabilities were exposed and used to access our data? And what action is the company going to take to prevent this from happening going forward? I know Kevin or Martin, if you had anything to add to those comments there. No, I think I think those are the the, the key elements, uh, Kevin. And and like you said, I think one of the, you know, the just thinking about experience observing companies going through this, the more uh, the better the controls and the more practiced a company is in responding. Obvi uh, perhaps obviously, the easier this this time is going to be. You know, if there uh, there are companies that have gone through the the, the work and the expense of practicing recovery from backups, um, from immutable backups, which is harder than sort of a, a soft recovery. Um, those those uh, plans and that practice pay off in this time period. You're you're um, even though obviously uh, in this scenario you're in a in a, a position of having been attacked, you're certainly in a stronger position if you have folks coming to you that you know have uh, pulled off a recovery in practice several times before and know where the data is, know how to rebuild servers, um, know the sequence. <laughs> uh, uh, you pointed out um, not everything is equal. Not every server needs to come back up at the same time. So watching companies that have been uh, attacked, uh, you can see the differences between those that have the stronger controls and the practice and the plans and, and those that are weaker in those areas. And I would just reinforce from um, the earlier discussion. You don't need to be making these decisions and, and undertaking this yourselves it is getting getting that expertise through th through forensic firms. Insurance experienced outside counsel dealing with these issues and having to work through these decisions. Because I've said to many institutions and um, public speaking, but also. Uh, when it comes down to paying is obviously as a US government regulator and going to advise that paying ransom is not always the best thing. <laughs> that being said, when you're hit with this, you are going to make some of those difficult decisions. A and the more you can um, work with those that have had expertise and experience in dealing with this outside counsel, insurance, forensic firms, the better you'll be able to make informed decisions around recovery and resuming operations and mitigating the attack. Yeah, and Kevin, like you said earlier, I think consulting with your regulators as well. I mean, we have safety and soundness responsibilities in terms of making that assessment, but regulators have likely seen similar type attacks in other financial institutions and, and are in a position to be able to share what, the, what they saw and what were best practices. Thank you, Kevin. Now we're going to move to the end of the event, and this one is directed towards you, Martin. If the WebEx facilitator could put up the third poll question, which is, what would be the last thing you would do before ceasing your routine engagement with those remediating? We'll give the uh, poll a little bit of time. The options are to be briefed on an after action review and any plan adjustment. Make sure the institution had completed the most critical tasks in the remediation project. Communicate about our experience for the benefit of the system and complete all required regulatory actions. We have a little bit of time left on those answers. And Anna, you said it uh, to begin as we went through uh, the timeline, but there's not not a bad answer here. <laughs> Actually, I have been answering myself just to try out the functionality and, and didn't this time. Kevin and Kevin, hopefully, and Anna, hopefully you answered. 
Okay, you're I was able to. to. Yeah. <laughs> So we'll see the uh, the results here in a minute. And yeah, pretty evenly spaced, and uh, several that are uh, that didn't answer. But uh, again, I I don't think there's um, a, a particular uh, answer that's that's necessarily better than the other. A looks like it maybe uh, nudged out the others. Be briefed on the after action report and the uh, the. Uh, tasks uh, to be done. I, I, I think that's key um, in adjusting plans. I think it's easy to think about, um, you know, that you'd stay engaged with the, the IT team, whether uh, internal or a combination of internal folks and external folks uh, to deal with uh, the event and get things back online. Um, but uh, staying with it past that point to consider changes to your incident response plan. Uh, staying with it past that point to consider next year's budget implications. Uh, one of the watchwords uh, or, or, or verbs, adjectives, I guess, uh, that, that we've been using a lot and listening to and reading about is resilience. Resilience by design. Uh, you know, uh, creating resilience, uh, not only for uh, pretty uh, severe attacks like a ransom malware attack, but that kind of resilience will be useful in lots of different events. And um, uh, we purposefully titled this and, and put in other cyber or IT events in the title. Um, so again, I, I think just sticking with it to the end, it's easy to, once things are back up and running to to let go a little bit. And um, this was interesting, an interesting statistic. and. You know, I can't uh, speak uh, to the, the depth of the survey, but a, a company uh, called Cyber Reason uh, published a survey they did of not just financial services and not just U.S., but um, companies across the world in multiple sectors. And the statistic that stood out to a few of us when we read this is that 80% of businesses that chose to pay a ransom demand suffered a second ransomware attack often at the hands of the same threat actor group. <laughs> so if, if that isn't uh, a motivation for, you know, sort of answering A, B, C, D, and whatever else I can do, I, I don't know what is, but um, uh, that's striking. I, I, I personally, and I don't know, Kev, uh, Kevin Allard and, and Greenfield, if, if you've seen this, I think in the U.S. banking system where we've seen these attacks be successful, I think generally companies are sticking with it after the fact and putting into place uh, controls that are greater and, and, and mitigate this risk so that they're not in that statistic. And again, at international survey um, uh, across across lots of uh, lots of industries. Um, I, I mentioned it before, but uh, making sure we complete the most critical tasks and our remediation project is critical. Um, there is important. Um, this kind of goes back to the comments at the very beginning. Um, authentication and authorization would be it, it is a great control to evaluate. Perhaps when you do, you kind of the conclusion we're as good as we possibly can be. But uh, working multi-factor authentication deeper into the organization. Uh, one of the things our agencies are considering together is um, what we've said publicly about even machine to machine communication. And so the emergence of more and more partnerships with um, companies outside your bank, where there are integrations uh, between your systems and theirs, uh, perhaps very sensitive data going back and forth, there are strong authentication mechanisms to put in place to govern those and, and control those, those exchanges. And um, uh, you know, 20 years ago, people weren't talking about that. People, you know, 20 years ago, we were all talking about our customers, bank customers coming in and 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 uh, making sure if they could move money that they had multi-factor authentication in place. Uh, today, uh, today, the, uh, the the watch phrase is uh, in, in in IT and cybersecurity circles is zero trust, which means. Don't don't trust anybody or anything logging into your systems. Assume all of them are malicious and lock them down to just the, the very smallest 
uh, access and, and authentication, uh, authentication and then access that you can. Um, uh, and then the, the last thing I, I would say, um, and, and sort of the reason for the picture here is communicate about your experience for the benefit of the system. Um, we've been, as, as a regulator, saying this for a while. Um, uh, in fact, uh, through the FFIC back, I think in the 2014 timeframe, we put out a, a statement when we did a cybersecurity survey of, of banks and, and created the FFIEC cyber uh, assessment tool. Uh, we also at the same time promoted membership in the FSISAC. Uh, the FSISAC is a great organization that's a, the result of a public private partnership uh, that collects information from uh, members and participants in the industry, anonymizes that information and gets it back out at a lot of varying degrees of specificity, gets out uh, monthly reports. Um, I was just looking at their uh, community institutions and association summary report that comes out on a, um, on a uh, weekly basis. Um, they, they send, they have uh, very detailed technical information that can go out to uh, IT folks or uh, chief information security officer groups. Um, so get, so FSISAC is a great example of an organization that you can talk to, convey your experience, uh, what the threat vector was, who it was after the fact, already mentioned the government, uh, the FBI field office, US CERT, um, uh, obviously your regulator, um, suspicious activity reports. Uh, hopefully most of you think about these severe incidents and think, you know, when, when things wrap up and we know what happened, we're going to give that information uh, to law enforcement through a suspicious activity report. Those are used. Um, we're, we evaluate those. We see what's happening. Some are better than others, but uh, reporting what happened at your company, whether it's a ransom malware attack or another type of attack, is uh, through a suspicious activity report is a very useful measure for us. One other thing uh, I, I failed to mention, we, we uh, checked in with FSISAC last week and 75% of, U, about 75% of U.S. insured depository institutions are FSISAC members at this point. So if you are not an FSISAC member and you don't uh, read once a week something uh, that is helpful with regard to IT and cybersecurity risk. Uh, sign up; you're in the minority, and uh, there's some there's some good work products they they put out. Um, so those are the three three things that um, I think are, are pretty critical uh, at the at the end of the event once you've uh, recovered and and can see uh, everything that happened. Thank you, Martin. Uh Kevin, either Kevin, do you have anything to add to this this last event? Uh, they're all very e excellent points, um, and, and really that whole reassessing what could have been done differently. Where where were some of the control failures, and how can you make sure that that's remediated throughout the organization? Because Martin had asked, and I, I will actually answer that. Yes, I have seen. Um, an organization get hit, and then six weeks later hit again. It wasn't ransomware; it was uh, another type of uh, attack to steal data. But it, it literally was a variation on the same attack because it hadn't been fully remediated, and this was a fairly sophisticated institution. So, just really doing that assessment and trying to close the control gaps. Yeah, in the beginning of this presentation, we talked about outcomes. From a cyber event, and all my outcomes that I discussed early on were pretty negative. What this question kind of highlights is, although good or bad, uh, outcomes from a, going through a cyber event can be a learning experience for the bank management and the bank board. Hopefully, you know, maybe we've, as Kevin just talked about, maybe we've uh, figured out ways to improve our control environment. Maybe we've in, uh, figured out ways to improve our cyber hygiene in the organization. Thank you. It seems as more and more attacks are developing, we see an awareness of the need to enrich our cybersecurity program. There's a lot to think about. So based on our discussions, here's some uh, decision points that I can I will consider going forward. Upon the discovery of the event, 
I'll need to assess the situation. What are the most critical things that we need to do? What is the damage? I need to assign roles, tasks, and responsibilities. I need to stop the attack. This could mean customer service disruption, identify who to communicate with, and determine what are the critical steps to recovery. After the first day, we need to determine recovery feasibility, assess the damage, backups, work with a third party, vendors to reconnect, and who on the outside do we communicate with? Do we pay the ransom? And then longer term, how effective we were on our actions? Do we need to make some adjustments? Are all critical plans complete? Have we made sure we notified and completed regulatory actions, filings, and communications? Um, I hope I didn't miss anything. Um, it seems like there's a number of tools that we can use. Uh, the FFIEC has a destructive malware statement that they have out on their site. Um, the CSBS has the ransomware self-assessment tool and the DHS Cybersecurity Infrastructure Agency Ransom Guidance and Resources is available as another tool. I'm sure there's many more out there. Is there anything else anyone would like to add to this discussion before we send it over to the next session? I would just say, uh, Anna, as we look at those three uh, tools, um, you know, one that's that's really good is is the third one. Do you, I mean, they're all very good. <laughs> the self-assessment tool is, you know, a spot in time and, and hopefully recurring. You're, you're uh, using it to evaluate how mature you are today and then measuring yourself again a year from now, maybe using the same tool. The destructive malware statement is um, some of those best practices that are cyber hygiene sorts of controls. But the DHS Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency is updating their ransomware website, you know, almost daily. There is a lot of information there, you know, as a CEO or a, a director, uh, it may not be something that you'd be visiting every day. But um, in, in terms of knowing the state of the art for a, a chief information security officer, a CIO, um, or even grabbing um, some latest anecdotes for a board meeting to highlight the importance of a budget request or something. That is a, a very frequently updated site and an agency that's very, very focused on understanding this risk and, and the controls that uh, can be put in place to mitigate it. Yeah, and I can share in Ohio, we sent the, the ransomware self-assessment tool uh, out to all of our banks and our credit unions and asked that they respond to us within, I believe it was 60 or 90 days, basically telling us what, what were they using to assess their ransomware risk, whether it be the RSAT tool or some other tool to help assess their ransomware risk. We got a lot of positive feedback on basically our inquiry in, into where banks stood with regard to their ransomware uh, mitigation efforts. So, and similarly, I know for uh, our agency, our supervisory strategies for 2022 are focused on ransomware assessments and, and controls because we are seeing this pervasive. And something I always share is whenever we do these types of presentations, it, it, it sounds like a lot of gloom and doom. But I again go back to Martin's earlier comments on basic cyber hygiene will help prevent the majority of these attacks. I go back to these, these malicious actors are criminals, which means they're thieves and lazy, quite frankly. So it's going to be the least effort um, possible. And there's a lot of opportunities for them to um, exploit institutions that don't have some of the basic controls. So I always advise go back make sure you have the fundamentals in place make it difficult you may not be 100 percent secure but by the same token i laugh i will date myself if everyone remembers the steering wheel clubs to safeguard your car one of my friends said you think that's really going to protect you i said no but it's going to take them five minutes longer to steal my car than yours i hate to put it like that but Putting those basic controls in place, reassessing and testing them will be one of your best effort, best um, actions you can take to help prevent ransomware. Thank you, gentlemen. You were very helpful in, in explaining and, and stepping us through this exercise. I know myself and my, my board of directors take this very seriously. Um, if there's no other questions, I will turn this over to the host.
Michael, you're on mute. Hey, let me try that again. <laughs> Thank you, uh, thank you, Anna, very much for moderating this panel, and thank you, Martin, Kevin, and Kevin, for spending time with us today to walk through some of the thought process that our bankers need to engage in when they consider the potential for these cyber attacks and how they will respond. Obviously, the best planning is planning that happens in advance of the event occurring. Um, and while you promised to keep us up at night, I was not nearly as scared coming out of this as I thought I would be, so I appreciate that as well. So before we go to break, um, I'd like to point out that there are two more breakout sessions this afternoon. Um, and you, as an individual banker, can decide which you would like to attend. There will be um, specific agency breakout sessions, one hosted by the FDIC and one hosted by the OCC. Um, if the FDIC and the OCC are not your primary regulator, those of you who are joining us that are regulated by the Federal Reserve, you're welcome to choose um, whether you attend either of those sessions. 